The following is a presentation of the Belly Up Sports Media Network. The Flailing Tender Hockey Podcast brought to you today by BarnBurnerHockey.ca. Use promo code 1420BARN to get 10% off their all-natural hockey products and apparel at BarnBurnerHockey.ca. Today, uh, I'll be joined by an old friend of mine, Golden Gloves uh, heavyweight and super heavyweight champion, Canadian and North American kickboxing champion, jiu-jitsu champion, owner-operator of hard training here in Lethbridge, Alberta, strength and conditioning coach for the Lethbridge Hurricanes of the Western Hockey League, fellow native of Fort McLeod, Alberta, and a man that has proven that good, clean living is good for not only the heart, the soul, the body, but the hairline as well. Trev Hardy, how are you doing today? The man, the myth, the legend joining us today on the on the podcast. How are things, Trev? Good, thanks. How are you? I'm good, man. I'm good. Thanks for uh, coming on the show. It's been uh, kind of bugging each other for a while now to get something going, but uh, we finally made it on this February the 3rd, 2023. Uh, Trev, you grew up on the mean streets of Fort McLeod, as I did. Uh, you're a little older than I am. What got you into the fitness world? I'm sure it wasn't playing for the likes of Geno Koopman and and, uh, and Joe Bootland for the uh, the Arts Cataline or Bantam B team. What got you into the fitness world of things back in the day? Because it wasn't, it wasn't really a uh, a thing back in the day in Fort McLeod. It wasn't really that, but it was a rough go there going up, growing up in Fort McLeod for a while. And to try to become, you know, less of a non-factor, you know, socially. <laughs> and, and the, the um, like I say, the, the lawless streets of Fort McLeod were a little tough. And so I tried to get a little tougher by strength training, this kind of thing. And then my great friend, Eric Hermenko, was doing karate and kickboxing. And he took me on as a student. And then he brought me to his gym where he was training in Lethbridge with Junior Olson and Cal Fuller and Blair Orr yeah. and the likes of them. And that's what got it going. You were, uh, you, you, you played hockey a little bit. I remember back in the day, you were a big it, Bob Pro. To use the term loosely, yes. <laughs> yes, you, you put skates on. You, you skated around the ice. As, uh, you were a big Bob Probert fan back in the day, uh, the pugilism days and the, stuff, and the, and the likes. Uh, in your opinion, it was Pro, is Probert still the best that ever that ever did it in the fighting world in, the, in hockey? That's my humble opinion. And there's lots of super tough guys out there, but he was – he just – you know, he had that combination of he could score, he could play, and he – he fought all the big names and he had kind of as a fighter, probably the most attention and the rivalry with Ty Domi and with, you know, so many other guys, you know, Stu Grimson and Troy Crowder and, and just all the tough guys of the era. He was, you know, the cream roast to the top and there he was. The, the thing was like when you first got to starting to work with hockey players a little bit, like you said, you weren't you were more into the kickboxing and martial arts and the whole bit. Uh, when you first started working with hockey players, how did that all come about? Uh, did did somebody approach you? Did you approach somebody? How was the first transaction? And who was it? There was a player in Lethbridge named Jay Birch, and he took oh, boxing yeah, lessons yeah, yeah. with me during the summer. And he wouldn't be much older than you, I don't think. Uh, one year younger, actually. Was you younger? Yeah. Oh, of course, yeah. Sorry, I had the backwards. That's right. Yeah. He'd be born in 76 or so. 75, 76. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. And so anyways, he was boxing with me for one summer. He did a great job. And he had some concussion problems. So he had to retire in his 20-year-old year. But throughout university, I had a, a kickboxing boxing school, you know, to just make extra money. And it was fun. And and. We taught, you know, a lot of kickboxing students. And one of his friends, one of Jay's friends was Bryce Salvador, left for Jerry King, Bryce Salvador. Yep. And he came to the kickboxing class with Randy Perry and Dale Pierrington. And I started working with them regularly. And Dale really took it to the next level. And he had the whole team come. He made it mandatory for the team to come. And I met Brian Maxwell, became very good friends that worked together for a number of years. They hired me as a strength and conditioning coach. That year, that year, 96, 97, was the the year they went straight to the Memorial Cup, you know, final game. And it was the most successful year on paper for the team that they had ever had. And that group of players, there was Dale and, and Bryce, but also Byron Ritchie and Travis Sprigley were the two big ones that I worked with uh, a lot. 
And then other ones, you know, Shane Willis and Mark Smith and you know, Martin Honberger and just a large number of players that ended up going on to, to very successful careers. And that was my introduction to training junior hockey players. And yeah, it was a good one. And, and it's, it's been, it's been worked out really, really great. Yeah, I was going to ask you a little later, we'll get into that now. Uh, Dale Puritan, when he first came from, I think it was uh Kelowna, he got traded from, what was your first thought of him? Cause he's a big, big man and he wasn't uh uh, he was a bit intimidating just to be around as a, like I, I weighed 150 pounds back then, not much more now, but I remember Puritan on the ice and just when even off the ice, he was a big, big dude. What was your first impressions of Dale that when he first uh, came to Lethbridge from Kelowna? I only knew him as Lethbridge Hurricane. Like when he, the day that I met him, he was already on the Hurricanes and he was, of the three, he was, he wasn't quite as athletic as Bryce Salvador or Randy Perry, and, and both of those two, Salvador and Perry, were extremely athletic uh, guys, and they, you know, right off the bat were punching very hard and moving very well. And Dale, but Dale was the guy, he just had this real intensity to him, and he had this kind of a look in his eye. And Well, there was a look, all right. Yeah, we'll get oh, around absolutely. that. <laughs> and, and he, so we, we tell players all the time, there's this myth that you can't gain muscle during the season, and that season, Dale went from 195 pounds to 210 pounds during that season, a very successful season. And so he was able to do that. He trained. When, when I met him, he said, what can you do to help me? And I said, you know, you can come train with me. I was still competing as a boxer myself. And I said, you know, I'm going to be training. You can train with me. And I don't know if you will, but but he did. And he and he he trained, you know, sometimes like three times a day during the season. It was crazy. And, and he did, he put on 15 pounds of muscle during the season and might've been a little bit easier because he was suspended for a total of 20 out of 72 games. <laughs> yeah, he had some time bit. up in the press box. There's no getting around that. That's yeah. right. That's right. So he was burning a few less calories than <laughs> some of the players, but he really was a great captain and he did a really good job of motivating the whole team and, he was the guy that would step up anytime anybody needed anything on or off the ice. And he was a really, really good player. He was a better player than he's often, you know, acknowledged uh, for. And yes, he, and he literally fought his way all the way to the NHL. You know, we had, I believe it was 415 minutes in penalty minutes in, uh, in Hartford. The year Hartford won the American league championship. And then he, yeah, had an NHL run, and yeah, just yeah, great guy. And he was the he was really the progenitor of the whole hockey training uh, direction for me. It wasn't in my plans, and had I not met him, it I don't know if it ever would have happened. It would have happened. Like back then, there was a like a lot of teams had guys who could who could throw them a little bit, and a lot of teams they like, and then you had guys who were mid heavyweights that could that could chuck them a little bit, and they they would get themselves in a little bit of trouble by picking on the wrong guy. Was there ever a guy uh, back in those early hurricane years when fighting was still a lot more prevalent? Was there ever a guy that you said maybe you should just train and maybe just keep your gloves on and not maybe get get yourself into any trouble on the ice? Was there ever a guy or throughout the, your time with the Hurricanes? Was there ever a guy that you said maybe you shouldn't be fighting there were a few and th there were some guys that were just so like Byron Ritchie for example was so good on the ice but he was such a ferocious player that he would get into fights and then he would be of course off and be better off if he was on the ice and you know there there were players that you know that wanted to do it and it wasn't in their kind of DNA that wasn't their best the best part of themselves was not fighting, but they were, you know, such intense competitors that they wanted to do it. And yeah, there, there was certainly a few, you bet. Was there, was there a guy that kind of looking back over, over your time with the, the hurricanes and even the guys that, you, that weren't with the hurricanes guys, you trained in the summertime to come and see you. Is it that, that were third and fourth line kind of guys that were in the Western league. And then they, because they, you, you said, well, you, you need to do this. You need to do that. If you want to go to the next level, is there guys that, that really, uh, if you, that one guy might stick out in your mind a little bit that uh, without your, uh, your pat in the back and kicking the ass only three feet away, but is there a, a guy that sticks out in your mind a little bit that you, uh, might give yourself a pat in the back to, to transform his career a little bit by being in better, better shape. I don't know if, if I would give myself a pat on the back for it, but there were, there were players that exceeded expectations dramatically. And with hockey training, I kind of had a few 
three real generations now. The first generation was the, you know, born in 1976, 1977 players like Dale Parenton, Bryce Salvador, Byron Ritchie, Travis Brigley. The next generation was Robert Klinkhammer, Chris Verstig as the 86s, and then uh, Dem Setaguchi and Colton Yellowhorn and Daryl Boyle as the 87s, and uh, Spencer Hotchuk and Mitch Verstig as the as the 88s. And then the following generation, the the um, you know born in uh, 96, 97, uh, you know, like Tyler Wong and George Estefan and players like that. So in the first generation, you know, like Byron Ritchie. He was such was, a good player. Man, he was, he good. was a good player. And he was the guy that really took, you know, hard work off the ice to the next level. Like he, in his 19 year old year, when he arrived at, fitness test in Carolina he was he had a body fat of 14 percent which is which is pretty high for a forward and the next year he was down to five percent and that is just a dramatic transformation and that's literally losing uh his weight you know like 18 19 20 pounds of body fat and 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 he you know he really hard worked his way all the way there and so he was the guy that did that in that generation. In the next generation, it was it was Rob Klinkhammer, like like Chris Verstig and Rob Klinkhammer for sure. Both those two, like Chris and Rob, neither one of them were drafted in a BAM draft. Neither one of them played Team Alberta. Uh, Chris was drafted in the NHL, and Rob was an average ish player at age nineteen. Average to the point you didn't know if he's going to play major junior at age 20 and then it was that summer he kind of figured it out what he wanted to do and decided what he wanted to do with his life and he just did it and he just he was one of those every inch adds up to the mile uh guys and everything he could do you know the way he trained the way he ate the way he practiced the way he put in extra work and all the healthy living practices like he really just you couldn't have done a, a better job I can't imagine doing a better job with anybody than, than he did, you know, kind of for himself. And now that was just great. And then Chris first dig as well. Like, like he really, you know, like he, like if you look at Chris first in Rockford in, in the, the last year he played in the American league, he had 174 penalty minutes. So, you know, he was fighting and just grinding it out, doing everything he could do to get, you know, kind of, his foot in the door in the NHL, and then once he did, you know, he was run up for rookie of the year. Yeah, I read uh, somewhere today when I was, I don't know why I was researched. I know most of well, I've known you my entire life pretty much, so I don't know why I was doing it, but I was doing some reading today, and uh, Chris Verstig actually said that he uh, he probably wouldn't, he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't have made it to National Hockey League without your help, because uh, he was a, he was a scrappy kid from the north side of Lethbridge with not much direction and and the like. But and you gave him the chance to uh, to train for free back back in the day. And uh, you said and you you told him I don't know if it's true story if it's one of those clickbait things, but he uh, he said that you you told him that uh, one day if you make it, you can pay me then. Uh, what's the truth of that story? And what what was your take on Versti when he was a 15 year old from the north side of Lethbridge from the I, I don't want to say the wrong side of the tracks, but the the wrong side of the tracks, I guess. Well, the first thing is I made him say all of those things. Said, Don't say these things about me now. Then I'm going to beat you up. <laughs> and so that's where that all came from. And when when we when I met him, he was he was 15 years old. He was 125 pounds. He was he was going to be turning 16 and eligible to play in the Western League. And his friends called him the circus midget. This is in the less politically correct. Yes, era. Well, back when you could say whatever you wanted and everything. Now else, would yeah. be the circus little person. <laughs> yeah, but he, you know, what, he wasn't very big, but he did that summer. He bulked up to um, to a, um, a, a stocky one forty two. You know, put on uh, seventeen pounds in the summer and yeah. made the hurricanes. And Jesus, he was just always the guy that he had an energy about him and a presence about him and a confidence about him that just, you could tell he was going to do something big. And if you look at his old interviews and just the way he spoke and his presence and his self-assuredness, it, it um, you know, it, it surprised a lot of people when he did it, but 
people that knew him, you know, they certainly, they certainly weren't shocked. Like it was, and, and he, you know, he was, he was always so funny in the gym that it was, there's, there's always funny guys in the gym, like really funny, but he was one of the funniest and he was always playing pranks on everybody. And, and he was, you know, I've seen him before. He's a very talented musician and he would, he would sing songs all the time and make up songs about everybody and their relationships. Well, I remember there. there's the Stanley Cup uh, parade in 2010 when he made up that song on the stage. He was probably a few Bud Lights deep at that point, I'm thinking. But oh, uh, yeah. I, I, remember, I remember that one pretty vividly. I was like, holy man, where's this one going? That's a, That was a great one. He did it again in 2015 as well. Yeah. And it was a duet. And, and But he, you know, in the 2015 at, at the parade, like he – Every game they give uh, most valuable, like the team votes on who's the most valuable player and, and give them like a, a title belt and the belts passed on every game. And the team voted on Chris for the final game. And he gave the belt to, uh, at the parade to the, you know, the son of a trainer that had died during the season. And it just, he was always doing stuff like that as well. Like he gets, like he was, he was flamboyant and charismatic and funny and all those things. But he was like really, really good guy, and he was always a like, very good person, always doing things like that behind the scene, and you know, just helping people out, and and real great ambassador for hockey in general. No, that's great. Uh, we'll get back to fighting a little bit, but back in the uh, late, or well, just I guess it'd be the uh, mid two thousands to late two thousands, the CTE thing came about, and there was a lot of uh, travesties that happened throughout the hockey world. Uh, and we've known that the like, fighting was always dangerous. There's no getting around that, especially for for one guy. Usually in a fight, a fight, fighting can be really dangerous. And you don't like 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 to make light of the whole situation, but um, like it's just not a part of the game that much anymore. If you see one fight every five or six games in the Western League, where you used to see five or six fights a period, um, do you miss the, the fighting aspect of the game of hockey a little bit? Because it, it used to be who won and were there any fights and nobody really cared who won, right? No, that's right. And the thing is, so for, just just to, to build on what you said, you're 100% correct. And like with Lethbridge right now, the Hurricanes, like there's, there's, there's one guy on the team that fights more than anybody else or probably more than everybody else combined. And back in the day, the second or third year that I was there, Eric Goddard, for example, had 39 fights one year and, and 41 fights the second, 80 fights in two years. And that, and Eric Goddard, you know, good friend. And he would say, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm okay that we did all that. I'm, I'm, I did, you know, literally fight my way to the NHL and, you know, to a Stanley cup and all this, but we didn't know at the time the toll that was taken on young people. And had I known then, then then I certainly wouldn't have been encouraging it as much. Had I known then, I probably wouldn't have competed near as much myself as a boxer or a kickboxer or just got hit as much. And, you know, since then, you know, I, I've had, uh, I've had one friend who we lost to, to suicide relative to CTE and there are many others, and it's when you the, the more you know about it, you know the less you are you know likely to be encouraging it, and it's becoming less and less a part of hockey. And it's a it is a good thing, and you know like it that period of time, you know it 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 was the spirit of the times. There was there that was the information people had, and people did what they did, but you take these guys like Dale Pierrenton that were groomed to be fighters and entertain the masses, you know, by fighting. That was their, that was their role. I mean, like to, to look after guys on the team. Yes. But as you say, it was something that the public wanted to see. And so when, you know, players are putting together their, you know, legal directions to get some compensation from the league for what, for, you know, things that have happened to them relative to fighting, then, I think that's good. And I don't personally have uh, near as much of an interest in uh, grooming people to be fighters per se. Mm -hmm. We like exposing as many people as possible to the very best of the martial arts to create more powerful people. But to, you know, to have people smash each other in the head in hockey games and in, you know, competitive arenas, 
all the time, you know, we see that is the the risks outweigh the rewards in my humble opinion. Well, yeah, I, I agree. Like just like back in the, back in the day and old, old, old man get off my porch and everything. It's uh, it's funny how we used to watch those games and, and just, and be animals in the stands almost. Or even when I played junior hockey, the, the way, the way it was, and it was absolute lunacy, the fighting that would occur. And you look back and you go, what the hell? Like, what were we doing? Like, how could I be that mad about something that's nothing? And just, and then the stage, I think where, where it really got, worn for me a little bit was the staged fights that were happening that that guy's fighting that guy and they won't see another shift and it's like well what's the point of this you're not you're not taking a guy out of the game you're not uh, you're not helping the game at all it's just that guy's fighting that guy because their agents want them to go or whatever it may be and that's when i kind of went like maybe we should look at taking taking out of the game is there still a place for fighting in the game maybe maybe not um when a guy gets gets hit and there's automatically a fight for whatever reason i don't think that those are required either but it's just a, it's just a things well everything's just different nowadays than it was 20 30 years ago yes it seems to be evolving doesn't it and it's getting like every aspect of human evolution it's getting everything's getting a bit better and everybody's a little bit safer and you if you look at those characters that we talked about and they're all great characters, everybody got to bask in their exploits, like the, you know, like uh, Gino Ojic and, and Todd Ewan and, and Derek Bugard and Wade Bielak and all yep. these, these great characters that Rob Probert that have passed now. And, and, you know, their, their life was, was inordinately hard because of that hard role that they played. And in retrospect, it wasn't fair to them. And to have this sort of new direction where you're 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 building a better game, you're building better people, and you're keeping people safer, it's it's a good thing. The game has changed so much, not only off the or on the ice, but off the ice a lot. To, training camp used to be for actually training camp and getting in shape and and maybe sweating the booze out from the summertime or whatever it may be. Uh, that, that's this only this is thirty years ago. Uh, in the last ten years, it's changed even more with how much knowledge there is towards uh, fitness and nutrition and the like, what's the biggest thing you've seen since you've uh, joined the hurricane staff back in 96, like you said, to, to what it is now, what's, what's the biggest change for uh, in, in, in the, the world of hockey that, that you've seen it in the fitness, the fitness and, uh, and health, the health part of the world. Well, it's so different now. I was one of the first, you know, strength conditioning coaches in the Western League, someone that was giving given like someone like like a specific like that as a specific role, it would be that would normally be something that was done by by a, say an athletic trainer, and that would be part of what they were doing was strength conditioning. And now most teams have one, or basically every team has one, and it's just so much uh, a part of hockey culture now. And, you know, like the, the training in the off season is about rebalancing the body and then getting stronger and using strength to get faster. And every sort of metric, you know, like where you're measuring speed and measuring strength and measuring body fat and finding as many possible ways to improve the attributes of a hockey player. That is just so much more comprehensive now. And it's, as you say, it's, it's, crazy, yeah. it's a year long thing. And you want it to translate to the ice. You know, we're going to make players faster and more athletic and stronger. You want to help players be more durable, so less likely to be injured in the short term. In the long term, you want to be able to facilitate recovery from injuries and facilitate recoveries just, you know, from game to game. And, you know, there's a lot more involved than, than there used to be, but it's just part of the evolution of the game. And... It's been it's been an interesting process. It's been interesting to see all that, how that's all gone. Absolutely. When a when a new kid comes to Lethbridge to, from either for, uh, as a rookie or he gets drafted in, the, in, in as a fifteen year old, and they they uh, they come and they might go to their first training camp and th they know they're not playing that season. Uh, is is there some kind of a, a fitness regimen that you give them? Is there is there is there a dietary thing or do they, like once they they leave Lethbridge when their their season starts September to go to their Bantam team or their U whatever? I, I don't I can't keep track of all these different U's that there is. But is there something that you give that give each of these pro like mainly the prospects? Not not some kid who shows up and he's gone back to wherever land. But no, the, that's the, right. Do, do the there, prospects a get a, a bit of a? The, ahead, there, there, the two things on that. There, there are a few things that we do that are not done by most strength conditioning coaches and are sort of 
a little bit outside the box, but are very helpful. So everybody is introduced to those principles. And then we provide support through the year with strength training and with nutrition and troubleshooting when a player has an issue here or there with injury or, you know, is having a hard time putting on weight or muscle or whatever it would be, then, so the answer is yes. And th there, there are, like I said, there's some things that we do that are, that have been extremely helpful to players. And we, we make sure that everybody is, 